This week's episode of The Voice Party is brought to you by Big Boy Raps. Get your car wrapped by some of the most experienced and skilled in the Bay. Big Boy Raps, where the big boys play. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Voice Party. It's me, JD. I got Phil. What's up, Phil? Oh, hey, how's it hey, going? Hey, everybody? what's going still on? Still pushing hey. all the buttons. Still pushing all the buttons, my man. We got a very special guest. Introduce yourself, sir. What's up, everyone? This is uh, Robin D. Lopez, straight out of Richmond, California. A.K.A. Richmond, California's own Richie Valens. <laughs> A.K.A. Richmond, California's own, own Richie Valens, y'all. <laughs> Peep game. This is a real, I'm Lou Diamond Phillips Lost Child. <laughs> I didn't even notice that until you mentioned it right now. Like, like, oh, yeah, he does look like Lou Diamond Phillips. I hella thought you were, you like, you were sending me, like, mixed signals <laughs> when you wore the La Bamba shirt. He got the, you got your La Bamba shirt on. You got the like, La Bamba Terminator shirt from I, Crystal Cat it's 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 yeah and I know I, I didn't even yeah, when I pulled up and I seen you wearing the shirt wearing the Bob shirt I Literally thought, I I thought you were gonna like start off the jump making a joke and yell out Richie yeah no and I was kind of disappointed <laughs> I could still do it you could do it on your way out as yeah. you leave and you know I'm uh, down for that <laughs> Robin <laughs> yeah thank you for coming man I appreciate it uh, uh, I think we've talked about this a while back about having you on and, yeah. uh, and it's crazy because like I, I know your sister uh, she's she's friends with my sister so like I'm, I've met her she's coming to the shows and I didn't like I was just telling you I didn't know you were Mexican <laughs> <laughs> you look Mexican today yeah yeah, yeah the, the funny story about when and when I don't look Mexican yeah and I, I kind of explained this to you earlier but apparently when I'm in my feelings and I'm eating and mm-hmm. I'm not taking care of myself and I'm getting a little chunk chunk <laughs> I people think I look Filipino. That's what I thought. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, you, I don't. You see a lot of yeah. Filipinos in Me- in, in Richmond. Yeah. They're they're there. Yeah. And then when I'm slimming down and like I'm I'm looking good and <laughs> like I'm wearing my Thought Boy short shorts. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I was told these shorts are like Thought Boy shorts. Yeah, look how short oh, they yeah, are. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. I can see but that. But like yeah. I, you know, apparently when I'm slimmed down, they yeah. look Mexican, and so. This it's, it's you look it's Aztec today. Aztec, yeah, yeah exactly. I just, I just got blasted nice. uh, a couple of days ago with some Aztec work. Hell yeah. Um, but nah, like when people tell me I look Filipino, yeah. Sometimes I don't know whether to take offense or to like uh, tell them I appreciate you, mm-hmm. because when they tell me I look Filipino, sometimes that might be codified language for like, hey boy, you getting a little big. Oh, you need to hit the gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like me, I was told I look Samoan the other day. I'm like, ooh, ooh. I think it's because of the weight. No, oh, you muscular. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's me, it's the me, weight. <laughs> come on, man. Let me gas you up. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it's and that's and that's because I was wearing like a kind of a, a like a Hawaiian type shirt. Oh, that will do so it. So that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, someone said it looks like you crack coconuts with your head. <laughs> <laughs> that was a knee slapper. That was a knee. <laughs> nah, uh, yeah. one time I was out in the city. This is back when I went to school at San Francisco State. I was like at the Whole Foods and Ocean Avenue, which oh, felt yeah. hella weird. Yeah. Like, that's not where I shop. No. I go to local corner marts. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was in there and I had like this Hawaii, this tank top from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And you know, I have my tattoos and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And this dude came up to me. He said, didn't didn't say hi or anything. He's just like, "Are you Hawaiian?" <laughs> and I was like, "The," and I looked at him. I was like, "The fuck?" <laughs> I, can, I can see. That. And this young lady who was with me, like who I went to school with, and she's like laughing. She's like, "What's that about?" I was like, "I don't know, but I think I'm gaining weight." <laughs> <laughs> no, you do look like right now, like you'd be a Hawaiian surfer. You know those dudes that are They're built. Like, and she, yeah, <laughs> like Jason Momoa's cousin. I, I could rock with that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's not a that's a compliment. I'll take that. I'll as take a that as a compliment. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you you look like you could be a, a couple of different things. I'm like a shape shifter when yeah. it comes to ethnicities. And it's crazy because like Mexican's the last thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's for me too. But you know, that's probably the result of my ancestors just com- being being completely colonized and yeah. the whole nine yards like. I'm a mixture of I don't even know. This whole time, like my whole life, I thought I was supposed to be mad at the Spaniards. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, "Y'all raped my ancestors. Yeah. We got issues." Yeah. Um, 
one of my siblings did one of those little 23 and me thing mm-hmm. we clowned him for it but um <laughs> it came back <laughs> ain't no spanish blood in us it's french. it's french and i was like damn no wonder i'm no one. wonder i'm smooth I, I know yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you smoke your cigarettes like this <laughs> we we motherfucker <laughs> yeah that's true this the, the 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 french were like a bigger i mean not a bigger but they were a huge part of of like in mexico right? yeah yeah, yeah. Dang, for a lot of the world, actually, yeah. not just Mexico, <laughs> Africa, yeah. Yeah, so, like, I get clowned for that, like, oh, that the French in you. That's where your smoothness comes yeah, in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did, my brother did one, too, and uh, for me, the majority was Spanish. Mm-hmm. Spanish and, like, J- Jewish. I mean, I, I figure we, you Jewish. know, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I'm not good with my money, so that's <laughs> not, <enough. laughs> I don't know, <laughs> yeah. I, no one told my jeans. Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, but man, you got a lot of stuff uh, going on. Um, like I said, we know some people in common, yeah. and I and I've, I've heard some things that I kind of confirm, and I, I well, wanna, hopefully it's good things. It's a lot. It's all. It's all good. Sheet. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's all good. But if you have a rap sheet, you know, if it's something interesting, feel free. No, I'm uh, kidding, basically, I'm, I'm not robbing anyone. I'm not pushing things on the streets. We cool. Okay, You're safe. Good. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. The hammer's in the car, though. Okay. All right. I, <laughs> I, had, I had cash in case you were. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Right, like as of right now, what's what's something you got going on project wise or, or, or that you're working towards? So right now, so I like live in like this duality of um, of life. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I got like this creative art side where I've been working on various projects and this other side where like I'm just a geeked out nerd, nerd from the hood. Yeah. Um, like I call myself the hood ecologist. The hood ecologist. Um, research wise, like apparently i'm responsible for helping save the fish in california wow. and i'm supposed to be the one that's going to be leading policy on changes in water quality throughout the state nice i don't know how i walk myself in that shit but uh, whoever allowed that decision to be made they probably fucked up um <laughs> on the creative side i do a lot of photography dabbling now in videography and filmmaking mm-hmm. um and for me they're not mutually exclusive like they intersect Mm -hmm. um i've used photography as a way to share my science and share it with the broader public because let's be real uh no one's reading peer-reviewed journal articles um half folks don't even know what that is yeah and science is not doing a good job at sharing what we do or how we do it and so like there's just this huge barrier so i've used photography as a way to like really share the excitement like i'll throw my camera in the water and I'm like, I'm not paying for it. That's someone else's money. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll throw my camera in the water and, you know, get pictures of fish and things like that or when I'm going out traveling at different field sites. And so that's my way to expose our community members to that, let the UC, like, not only can you do it, but, like, there's someone who looks like you Mm -hmm. that's doing it. And so it intersects in that way, but I also use my, the project that I got going on right now to work on sharing the voices of our community, like, really... Uh, centering what we are I there's a thing I operate with called like asset based framework I'll explain I can explain that really briefly like when we talk about when folks talk about the city of Richmond Mm -hmm. they'll be like oh that place is hella poor the people Mm -hmm. are broke they you know they live in like broke down homes and shit like that violence and all that yeah the violence like I ain't ain't trying to get on that but like that deficit model thinking that's Mm -hmm. like projecting us into the deficit for sure and so I think of asset based framework like no, we got all this beautiful talent. Like, we got folks like JD out here doing a thing with the uh, <laughs> the podcast. Oh, he's doing a little dance too. We got people who, who move like Jagger. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. And, but we got a lot of talented For young sure. folks, and like yeah. that's what I'm trying to actualize. So that's more or less what I got going on. I mean, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Yeah, no, yeah. And I, like, I went to your event the other day. I had to leave early because I worked the next day. But yeah. Like, um, you know, you you had the 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 film screening. Is that your film that you screened? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. You're highlighting, and that's another team that we work with now. We're working on the 5K with yeah. moving forward, and um, I, I like that. You know, you are part of that, and and like we're all kind of connected. All we were both from Richmond. Yeah. We grew up in Richmond, and that's uh i guess you could say that's the inspiration behind this because a lot of what we do highlight is richmond talent yeah and richmond community leaders 
filmmakers, you know, there's a lot going on. And I think there's something about, you know, growing up in Richmond, which you did, like you said, yeah. we saw, I mean, it's a, do- a different Richmond than it is now. Oh, very different. Very different. <laughs> I, it's like it's there's a thing where like a lot of the people uh, I've read like who experienced World War Two in England like there was a lot of creativity after yeah. aftermath you know which was like the the Beatles Black Sabbath they yeah. all kind of came out of the same places where they were cleaning up the the rubbles of of the war yeah. and, and I I kind of feel like that's kind of a little Renaissance happening in Richmond right yeah. now with with all these different things popping up and yeah. people doing different things and it's all like a collective of, of artists and just people who want the things to get better like yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way you frame that. Like that, that asset based framework thinking yeah. like, thinking like we came out, we, let's be wrong. Let's be honest. We came out the gutter. Like we came out yeah. some real shit during some, the late 90s <laughs> yeah. and early 2000s. Like yeah. there's a lot that I'm sure we can get into. Mm-hmm. Like it's yeah. just one of the things like you could look a dude in the eyes and you know, that fool's been through things or he's seen yeah. something like yeah. we making yeah. eye contact right now yeah. we're not yeah. falling in love but we yeah. know what's going on not yet not yet <laughs> but you know it the way you coined that and the way you phrased yeah. that like the the war war analogy mm-hmm. um i think that's a beautiful way to frame it that mm-hmm. people who come out these struggles they're uh, at least in our community they're not trying to project that same struggle onto the next iteration or the next generation. Yeah. They're finding ways to like, hey, let's make sure they don't suffer as well. Yeah. I mean, we see the homicide rates gone down. Yeah. We've seen like young men earn, unlearning certain toxic behavior. Like For to sure. me, like that's hella dope. Like I remember how I was when I was younger. And I'm like, damn, if I met me like 15 years ago, <laughs> me today would kick his ass. Yeah. Because he's an asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me 15 years ago would make fun of some of the stuff I do now. Yeah. You know, like like me, that. Like, and, and me 15 years ago would rob me. me today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. If me 15 years ago robbed me today, there'd be nothing to take. <laughs> no, <I'm joking>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, and, it, and it's it's beautiful that it's, there's like like now, like I started doing the, sh- the comedy shows in Richmond yeah. in 2012. And now there's like more audience coming into the shows, which is great. Like yeah. I see that there's more. Like my 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 thing has always been: I just want the artists or myself. I just want the people in the community coming to the shit because it's good to go to other cities to do stuff. And I love it. You know, I'll go to the city or Oakland to do shows. Yeah. But if like if I could do something like that in Richmond, where like a lot of locals come, yeah, that's what I. I mean, for me, it's entertainment. You know, I yeah. want to bring that and like show you, yo, this is all homegrown. That's what a couple yeah. show homegrown. homegrown. Yeah. yeah, it's all here, and um, um, I think it's a good model for other places that are you know yeah. that are with the same and then we you know like with you what, what you're doing I, I I mean we can get into that but like we got the refinery there <laughs> <laughs> hey Chevron if you're listening to this fuck you <laughs> I'm gonna decommission your ass when I get my PhD it's game over motherfucker you're working on that right now <laughs> that that you know, I'm I'm not even gonna lie I don't even front one of my life one of my lifelong goals yeah and hopefully it ain't gonna take my whole life yeah when I finish this PhD, I'm going for Chevron neck. Ooh. Put on a bulletproof vest, brother. We need you. <laughs> Always got it. Uh, yeah, that's that's um uh, I think you you were work you were at the at the rally recently, right? That they had for the for Chevron? Like there was a rally. Oh yeah, they I didn't go to that one, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I know I got these activists over here like, oh, he fronting now? He didn't go to that one. Ah. No, I was busy. That I was shooting for another event that day. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's that's the thing that I, like, the way I, I met your, I met your page. That's a weird thing <laughs> to say. I met your page. That's, that's, that's like a, the way you, you talk, because I didn't meet you, but I met your page. I ran across, uh, I saw your, your uh, shots from Richmond. That's, yeah. that's your page. Is that okay to say? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to double check, you know, um, and I just see you're like at a lot of local events, yeah, and and you know, cause I like I said, I work, and then when I'm off, I do these things, so yeah. I can't go. I, I'm not available to go to a lot of these. Yeah. I try, and that's when like when I met your page, I was I just like everything I miss, I see it right there. You yeah. got a bunch of good shots of everything that that you know I I wish I was at. Yeah, yeah, cause I'm I'm I always 
when there's something like an event like that yeah. where it's a good cause behind it, I try to be there, you know, um, as much as I can. Yeah. yeah. Even though I'm not going to contribute anything unless I like I get up there and tell j- these yeah. stupid jokes. <laughs> Start joking on Chevron. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like your shit don't stink. <laughs> <laughs> we smell that shit. <laughs> when we smell it, we fucking got breathing problems yeah. to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> nah, but like, you know, I'm happy you mentioned that. That, not like, that makes me feel good because that was one of the initial ideas around me starting like my own mm-hmm. photo gig. Yeah. Um, what to highlight and share like what our community is really about. Like mm-hmm. again, that asset based framework, like I'm tired of, you know, the images on the media being images of violence, being images of, of poverty stricken individuals Yeah. and making it look like we're someone charity case and mm-hmm. we're not. No, we, we, we fund very, our own shit. Yeah, we're yeah. very powerful people. We mm-hmm. know how to, we're very resourceful mm-hmm. um, in many ways. And to know that, you know, other people see it the same way, because you're not the first person who told me, like, uh, they see my page and they see things that make them feel happy about Richmond. Yeah. And for me, like, that was the biggest thing. The reason, you know, my nickname out in the, out in the area is Shots. So... <laughs> A little bang bang, but now we're a little <laughs> now. Yeah. But um, nah, like when when I started thinking about getting into photography, like in 2010, 2011, 2012, around that time frame, um, I was just thinking, like, damn, like when I hear the word shot, or like when I think of that, like I immediately think of gun violence. Yeah. I immediately think of the people I've lost, mm-hmm. and. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to reclaim that shit yeah. so that when people see it in our community, when they hear shots or they hear shots from Richmond, they think of beautiful visual art. Yeah. And they think of my beautiful French face. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what I want them. <laughs> Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> think of Pepe Le, Le Shots. Le Shots. Yeah. And so, like, you know, that, you know that, that's what I aspired for. Yeah. And, like, there's even uh, someone I know who's doing her PhD out in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, her name's Bernice. Shout out, Bernice. She's from Richmond as well. Oh, wow. Working on her PhD in, uh, I think, physics. And... And she even told me she found she found my page. Yeah. Um, so we we have known each other for a while. Like, she, and she she she, she, follow, met, she met your page. She met my page, <laughs> and this, this is the funniest shit because I don't amplify my photography page like that. Like I don't like do any self promotion on okay. my personal account. Yeah. And so she found my page because we we follow each other on a personal account, and then she found it. And she's like, I didn't know you were doing this, mm-hmm. and then she's like just like she shared a message like you know this makes me like want to tear up a bit inside because like this is so beautiful like i'm i miss my community yeah and so like you know that think like that like there are people who are from our community who have to leave for whatever reason yeah and so them meeting my page is uh <laughs> them still interacting with the community that's it's like a journal yeah of, of what's going on a hood ass journal hood ass journal <laughs> it's still a journal you know? and it, and that's you know which is the case for a lot of people, man. We can't. We, they had they get an opportunity or something, or yeah. or if they were involved in something and they gotta go, yeah. you know, the, that's a good way to still keep in touch with with uh, without just hearing about oh there was a murder, yeah, or or there was you know, you're reframing the whole yeah, which is like what a lot of us are doing, and yeah. and, and but you're like one of the ones in the forefront because yeah. you're in there in there like those like those 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 uh those white dudes in those cartel documentaries oh yeah they're like right, right there, there. It's they're like, like how right, are you not getting kidnapped they're behind, <laughs> they're behind the dude with the machine gun like right there yeah like, yeah, yeah. Nah, and you know, but, but for positive you're yeah. doing it for yeah 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 but like it's, it's cool though because now i'm at a comfortable situation where or a position where i'm able to let some of the young people who i mentor uh, like really young people like seven-year-old kids handle like my thousand dollar camera Wow. And so I just I let them run free because I'm like yeah. you know what the shit's insured yeah. like my business is legit I ain't got nothing to worry about the kid breaks it I get a new one yeah like I'm pimp the government like the government pimped me exactly and so and you're getting the kids perspective and when yeah you're shooting the and shot. yeah and that that's the whole thing like it I don't just want people to see Richmond through my lens yeah. I'm working to put more cameras in other kids' hands yeah so we can see the world through their lens because. The way we see it as adults is very different from how a, how a seven year old sees it. Yeah, because yeah, there's some seven year olds out there who st- who be trapping and like, and I'm like, okay, like Richmond hasn't entirely changed. Like, 
things are still happening and yeah. we people need to be able to see like this is what's going on so we know how to correct it we know how to provide the correct resources and i think that's important to like you know um to show the youth because you know like there's a lot of people like young people in richmond like you ask them when's the first time you saw someone murdered you know mm -hmm. when's the first time you saw a gun yeah you know how to load it and 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 I, you know yeah yeah Probably i do like three four years old <laughs> exactly yeah yeah <laughs> but then he's like you know how to put together a camera do you know yeah. how to put together sound equipment exactly and, and and then the interest for me one of the early things was like instruments mm -hmm. i mean i, I had seen some shit at, at an early age yeah. but i also i remember the first time i saw like my cousin put together his trumpet. I was mm -hmm. so excited, like, oh, I want to, you know. Yeah. And eventually, it did pique my interest to like performing. Yeah. Which, <laughs> you know, I still yeah. pursued it, and and it's uh, yeah, just just putting like pebbles of good to the youth yeah. that maybe that sees other stuff, yeah. and you know that balance. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's dope too, cause like yeah. we're we're able to make the cultural and social connection to it, like yeah. when we're talking about cameras, like. You know, when you're shooting, like we, we joke around, like, yeah, we're going to shoot this place up. It's going to be another drive by. Like, let's get this, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, you know, or like, you know, just just clowning on different uh, features or functionalities of cameras and like giving a little hood twist. Like, yeah. for me, that's hilarious and that's fun. But it's also it's culturally and socially relevant to for some sure. of these young people yeah. where they're like, OK, it's not I'm not a weirdo or I'm not strange for uh, seeing life differently because that's how I felt when I went when I started going to college yeah I was like man none of these motherfuckers have like lived the life I lived yeah and so it, it's hard for me to connect with them you feel like uh, an outcast yeah it's hard to yeah. joke because I'm like they they don't understand it yeah or like or then when they try to joke with me uh, there's something to like they say and I'm like that's not funny and then they <laughs> feel awkward yeah like someone this dude was from like SAC and he was like and, you know, in college, uh, yeah. at, when I transferred, at, so I started at CCC and then I transferred to SF State. When I was at SF State, this dude from SAC, he was like, um, at the time at SF State, I don't know how this happened, but my nickname at SF State was Thug Life. Mm. And I think that might be because I still wear my grill sometimes yeah. and the chain. Uh, <laughs> I was, you know, still look like I was with the shit. Yeah. Um, but like, he was like, hey, Thug Life, like, um, <laughs> you ever been shot? What's it like to be shot at? And he was joking. I was like, that ain't funny. Uh, and he's like, why? Like, he's like, aren't you thug life? I was like, no, that ain't funny. I was like, I was just shot at last month. Yeah. That's not funny. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I was like, you should be, but like, let this be a lesson to you. Like, yeah. you, you can't just come out the woodwork joking with someone yeah. like that if you're not part of that life or right. that experience. And how heavy it yeah. can be. And yeah. so I'm like, I could joke like that with, my, you know, any of my homies out here in Richmond because we get it. We understand it. We know that life. But someone who's not in that life and they're trying to clown on it. And it's different if they just asked you, have yeah. you ever been shot at? Like, you know, and just making fun of yeah. it. It's a different thing. Yeah. A whole different vibe. Yeah. And, you know, in the moment you allow someone to cross that boundary, then they start crossing and pushing the boundary even further for things that might be uncomfortable or unearthing trauma that yeah. you probably don't want to bring out as a child because we've seen some yeah you know, I've seen some shit yeah yeah <laughs> and it can kind of put you in a bad place for the rest of the yeah. day or maybe the whole fucking week if, yeah depending on you know yeah, maybe the whole fucking the whole, life <laughs> yeah 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 especially when it's when it's kind of like trivialized like it's uh it's 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 just another one of yeah, those they, things yeah that, they think it's a joke like they minimize yeah. the impact of, yeah. of gun violence in our community which is the cause of a lot of uh, we talked with Dante Clark about this when we had him recently it caused a lot of we don't know it but PTSD yeah and it's a big fucking thing yeah with a lot of us you know that yeah. that saw that you yeah. know or saw um either shot at or 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 you know just uh, a witness to, yeah. to which a lot of witnesses yeah. to the hood well like even just the act of firework like you know firework yeah. is dope like that's cool but like you know if our folk did a better job at like doing it in a dedicated time frame at a specific I, locations yeah like I don't care yeah but yeah. when you shooting off at like 3am 4am <laughs> start twitching I'm just like <laughs> like you know you know, thankfully I, I definitely know the difference between gunfire yeah, yeah, and sure. firework but yeah. still just the act of the loud boom yeah. and that resonating noise it can be triggering. I, it, if it's triggering for me and I consider myself someone who's like doesn't get easily bothered by mm. most things, then I can't imagine how it may be for a young child yeah. who's gone through things. Right. 
currently. So like, you know, those, those are things that I try to be mindful of. So survivors of, of, yeah. you know, which a lot of the people that I knew who had, you know, they were next to or with like a family member as they were gunned down. Yeah. So like, yeah, I can see how that would, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I, I see the value in reframing the whole shots. Yeah. With that, you know, because yeah. you know, another shot, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or shot, yeah. or shot. There's, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, that's that's a um, with, with what you were talking about, like in college, like you felt like a like an outcast. Yeah. Like they, a lot of the people that are there don't don't go through. Yeah. So like in a way, that's how I, how I kind of felt when I was going to school mm -hmm. when I went to college. The the two semesters yeah. that I did. Um, <laughs> It, it, you you feel like the whole culture of it excludes like people from the hood. Yeah, would you say that's a, a fair like that's beyond fair? Like the academia or college. Yeah, it was never structured or built with folks like us in mind. Mm -hmm. It was never created with black, brown, indigenous, and other folks of color. Yeah, uh, in mind to be in these spaces. So the fact that we're here. Is already disrupting the status quo. It's even more problematic, and you see more residuals of systemic barriers when folks from minoritized or marginalized communities like Richmond are entering these spaces because the resources and the mentorships are not robust enough to support us. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I would say these systems are not adequately designed to support folks like us. And so, who are usually working when they're going to college? Exactly. Yeah. And so, there's this whole thing of like we go through this process of survival mode all the time yeah we're constantly on edge we're constantly yeah. like what do we need to do what do we need to do yeah but the beauty of that though is that that what that's what makes us stand out yeah we grew up learning how to finesse we grew up learning how uh, at least i did how to uh sales training right how there. to <laughs> manipulate you know things with my words and you know just be smooth yeah uh how to get myself out of very tough situations with law yeah and so i'm like if i could do that i could do anything with these professors yeah. like that ain't nothing communication exactly uh, uh yeah like all these skills that yeah. you don't realize you pick up by like all the stuff you said com yeah. communicating a lot of a lot of the people in the hood like they're, they're really good at finances yeah. when they get you know if they're if they're in the shit like yeah. we, were talking, we were just talking earlier yeah yeah <laughs> so like a, no and like you know and pushing that a bit further like we have folks out here who have been in really intense situations mm -hmm. we kind of alluded to that earlier where people have been by other folks who like may have passed away things like that yeah um we know what it's like to be in very intense situations, and we know how to handle that very well. We're, we're stronger than any supercomputer that has ever been invented. Yeah. Because we are able to process and analyze information hella quick. And work under stress. Exactly. Yeah. And so, whereas folks like us are able to uh, get ourselves out of a life or death situation really quickly, yeah. folks from privileged environments who come to college they fucking lose their mind when they have to write an essay mm -hmm. or they have a quiz the next day. I'm like, that that's what you're freaking out about? Like, I'm not minimizing the, you know, the stress that you're having from that, but mm -hmm. like, you are blowing this up into something much bigger than it needs to be. Like, yeah. you need to learn how to take a step back, breathe, analyze everything around you and either accept you're going to fuck up and it's cool, fail is part of the process, you don't need to be perfect. I don't know what's going on in your little privileged plate household, mm -hmm. but you just need to accept what it is yeah. and, keep, and do it moving. Like, that's how we all to deal with it. Like, we take our L's and we take our W's. I get more W's than most, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> but I think that that's, that's the beauty, though, and, like, folks from the hood entering these spaces like academia. Like, yeah. We know how to process that information quick, and, like, yeah. it don't phase us. But if we realize we're in an uncomfortable or toxic situation, then we remove ourselves. And so that's why a lot of folks from the hood, they end up leaving college or not finishing their degrees because it's like, we're not going to do this to ourselves. Like, why would we put ourselves through this shit willingly if we're already trying to get ourselves out of this shit right mm -hmm. now that's going on where we're from? It's like a double entendre. Yeah. Like all these two different stresses. What's up, bro? Hey, it's, yeah, it's, we, it's, Joaquin, Joaquin snuck in here. Someone <laughs> snuck in late. <laughs> it's like Joaquin the ninja. Yeah. You know I seen his little feet behind the banner. I was like, trying not to make eye contact with his toes. But I was counting them. I was like, he has nine toes. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, and it's it's a. I'm glad he showed up because he's he works as an educator. Okay. So like that that's like the. I mean, you, you, kids constantly struggle to like even before they get to college. Yeah. Just in high school, I, there's so many times I was considering just dropping out in high school. Man. <laughs> to just start working already. I was told to drop out of high school. Damn. From my English teacher. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, wow. And so I, maybe you and I might have interesting conversations on like pedagogical training. Um, <laughs> hell yes. Hell yes. <laughs> like, because, you know, we were talking, JD and I were talking about this earlier, like how years ago, like in the Richmond and surrounding community area, like it was a very different environment. Things mm. were popping off very differently. Bodies were dropping left and right. I mean, yeah. we're talking when the homicide rates were anywhere between 60 to 70 uh, during those years. And you had supposed educators telling kids to leave, telling kids to drop out. That's what my 11th grade English teacher told me. And I was like, really? She's like, what's cool? De Anza. De Anza. And she's just mm. like, you, you, you should drop out. And then she's talking about the other student. Uh, there's a right as she said that there's a group of black students walking out, uh, walking outside the, the classroom. She's like, they shouldn't be here. They're wasting everyone's time. And, I'm, and I just remember sitting back, like, saying, you can't say that. Like, you're the teacher. You're supposed to be saving us. Yeah. And she's like, well, I'm not saving them. They're a waste of time. Why, why should we even, why should we be here serving them if they don't want to be here? And I was like, well, I don't want to be here because you're rude. Yeah. And, yeah. And she's like, well, you should drop out. And I, I damn near did. Like, for like two months, I wasn't going to school. Like, my dad would drop me off. And then I just go like Kenny Groves, go smoke out with my friends or something. Yeah. Go to Denny's, um, <laughs> you know, push the moves and things like that. And I I think about that a lot, and like it makes me think about like the pedagogical training that some of these archaic dinosaurs had, <laughs> and and their yeah. curriculum training. I, and I see it much different now. Like I see. I'm, There's a new wave of teachers. Yeah, I'm in the loop with a lot of the educators yeah. out in the district now. Um, and it, it's really dope seeing that. It's really dope seeing them connect directly with some of the local nonprofits. And mm -hmm. like, I've been shooting for some of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, that's beautiful. We're, we're actually seeing educators who get it. They don't have a white savior complex, but they're coming in. And they're like, we're here to listen. We're here to learn. Mm -hmm. We're not just here to tell you what you need, what you need to do, yeah. student. And so like and to adapt with what the I've seen that with like where they kind of adapt yeah. to what their lifestyle is. Yeah. And no, it's not a regular lifestyle. Yeah. A lot of them, not all. Right. But a lot of them. It's, yeah, it's not a, a lot of them. lifestyle. Yeah. And, and and implement that with the with the curriculum yeah. somehow. But what's even cooler is that now there's there's even more educators um, than in years past who are from our community. Mm. Like. So when I went to De Anza, that thing looked like a prison. Mm -hmm. And back then, that's like when the students who would get expelled from the other schools would be put there. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. so, like, yeah. shit was always popping <laughs> off. What I mean, year did you graduate? Uh, I feel old saying it. I'll just say it's somewhere, it was during the hot, the hot times. Uh, <laughs> But oh wait! I thought you were younger, man. How old do you think I am? I thought look, you were like look, 25, 26. I'm gonna take that. Look, if it ain't something like 93, you're not that old. Okay, it, it definitely ain't 93. <laughs> I'm taking 25. 02, 02, 03. Hell no. Look, look, I'm 05. You 05? I'm 05. From Deanza? No, from Kennedy. Oh, from Kennedy. I'm 08 from Richmond High. Dude, we don't fuck with people from uh, 05 Kennedy. That shit was hot. <laughs> <laughs> that shit was, yeah, yeah. Nah, no, but yeah. Um, we have I, a I lot. I thought you were from Richmond High, too. We have a lot of educators that are homegrown. Yeah. Uh, who mm -hmm. are now teaching at Richmond High, Deanza, Kennedy, and that's hella dope. Like, that's what I mean, like, socially, culturally relevant pedagogy. People who come in who have been through the experiences. Um, one of my nephews, he goes to De Anza now. And I'm, I'm hella jealous because the thing, the, the thing looked like a, a college campus yeah, now. Yeah, it does now, yeah. And mm, it's beautiful. And this fool was like, hey, can you come to my open house or something back to school night? And I'm like, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who? And I, but at the same time, I'm like, you know what? That's hella dope. Like, because my nephew's not that type either to like be, get excited about school. He, mm -hmm. was, he didn't have the best uh, support system when he was in middle school yeah. mm. and so I was really surprised he was really excited about oh, high school yeah. and so I'm like I'm thinking to myself man there must be a, like a young lady he's trying to talk to <laughs> like, man something going on and so I go 
um, because his mother was working, so she can she couldn't go with him, and I guess he felt most comfortable with me going. He yeah. just wanted someone to see what he's been up to, mm-hmm. and for me, like I was just like, damn, that's deep because he trusts me to enter this his space. His, this is his personal space. He trusts me to enter the space and get to know what he's about, but he also wants people to know that he's doing good, mm-hmm. and I think that's important. That. You know, so I didn't clown him in front of him, but uh, inside I'm just like, you a nerd. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but no, nah, I tell him, like, you know, uh, his name's Marcus. I was like, you know, Marcus, you know, that's good that you want us to know what you're doing. Like, yeah. You know, because that builds his confidence and hopefully that sets him on track for whatever he wants to do, whether mm-hmm. it's college or not. And so I went and like half his teachers were from the area. Like they grew up out here. Wow. And I was like, this is hella dope. And one of his teachers was like, my friend's friend like they went to middle college high school together wow um another one like was some uh, someone who i went to college with out here i was like this is hella That's cool dope, yeah. I was like this is what we need we, yeah. this is how you how you get young people to want to succeed and then it made all the sense to me why my nephew wanted me to come yeah because he had people around him that made him feel happy about what he was learning and what he was doing and that's what we need. That's the key. Yes. That's that's the the secret ingredient that's missing. Yeah. You know, with a lot of uh, what, like to keep us interested in in the topics. Yeah. Like um, we thought we had a guest, one of your friends. Uh, she works for a, a, a an organization that they kind of tailor the 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 um therapy for the hood, mm-hmm. which isn't the the same as therapy mm, is in yeah. other places. And you know they're obviously still working on funding for the project, yeah. but it's it's to help, especially young people that that you know are basically some of them have the same amount of trauma that a, that a soldier has after yeah. war, and, and and putting that with all the stresses of school, yeah. it's not gonna work yeah. all the time. It's fucking crazy. It's like, crazy. You know they're so I do a lot of work with Rich City Rides. Yeah, and you know. We're the ones that be mobbing through yeah. through the hood yeah. and bikes and like mm-hmm. making it cool. And like yep. part of that, like what I love about it is it's reframing what we think about people in the hood on bikes. Mm-hmm. They're not dope peddlers. Mm-hmm. You know that's not what we are. Yeah. We're just people trying to live nice, healthy lifestyles of all backgrounds, all um, all the cool shit that happens yeah. in other. We're just cities. getting yeah. some cardio in exactly. Yeah. And like, and yeah. if there are people who have mobility issues, we have a fucking pedicab where they could just sit and chill and ride with us like we are making it as accessible as possible yeah but at the same time some of these young kids that are coming out is it what you're talking about like that ptsd like yeah um you know there's some kids that like be holding pieces on them yeah. and we're just like you don't need that you don't need that and you know yeah. we're, we're we're beyond that now like we don't really have that issue but um I mean that's the reality, and we we can't ignore that. And I think that's hella dope. Like I want to learn more about this individual doing yeah, therapy, yeah. Because I think we do need to have our own, and this is what I mean when I constantly say social and culturally relevant uh, thing. We need to have things that are specific to the hood. Like we have things that are specific for different communities. We are not a monolith. Um, folks of color are not a monolith. Um, California is not a monolith. Mm-hmm. Like. United States is not a model. There's so many different things happening. Yeah. And so I think like that's dope to like venture into that track of hood therapy. I might need that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need it. <laughs> like, you know, it'll help. It'll help. Yeah. Like, like I need to get a year's subscription. <laughs> <laughs> I got some shit. <laughs> oh man. Everyone's yeah. been through something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. And that's on on top of that like yeah. you know you we're seeing these things now yeah and like you said you're a lot older than than, than i thought you were and and i'm 25 now yeah you're 25 <laughs> now yeah it's official, it's you, official. you're Blow working towards your phd yeah that's a like because you had all this other shit yeah. on added on that and you still gotten to where you are now man that's yeah. like very commendable yeah so what's fucking crazy you know well first let me back up when people hear me speak or when they see me, they don't see, they don't automatically scientist. think, oh, scientist, PhD, yeah. doctoral. You're here like, to mentor uh, gangbangers. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's crazy. Yeah. And, you know, and the fact that, like, I can move as my unapologetic self yeah. uh, 
because I've gotten this far. Mm-hmm. So like when I'm at UC Berkeley, this is the same fucking way I talk. I'll talk like this, and, you know, cuss words out my mouth. Mm-hmm. I'm over there, you know, with the headphones on, you know, singing Mac Dre in the middle of Hillgirt Hall. <laughs> not giving a fuck. Yeah. Like there's been times, a couple times, people caught me doing the fizz dance inside the hallway <laughs> on the first floor. I'm just like the hood <laughs> scientist. And so like you know, it's shit like that. Like that's cool, but yeah. like I also recognize that there's some privileges I have as it being, you know, a male in that space. Right. Um, you know, so, you know, that, that's my quick thing, a moment of acknowledgement that, mm-hmm. you know, as a male, uh, there are certain privileges that have allowed me to get this far. Oh, for sure. And so yeah. I, I try my best to use myself, not just as a, a blow horn or a megaphone for advocacy, but like as an accomplice, like create and hold space for folk to take up that space who, aren't uh, getting their voice and so that's kind of what i'm trying to do with my phd uh in a broad sense yeah um but what makes it bringing it back like what makes this all fucking wild is that when i applied uh, i wasn't really tripping about berkeley berkeley wasn't my first choice if anyone from berkeley if you're listening berkeley ain't shit if anyone's uh-huh. thinking about going to berkeley reconsider your options uh-huh. um Oh, and I say that not not joking. Like I'm being honest. Like Berkeley's over fucking rated. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll attest to that. I used to run that photo lab in Berkeley. Oh, yeah. I, can't, <laughs> I can't stand <laughs> Berkeley. Well, he's talking about the university specifically. We, we talk. Yeah, I know you I, hate the city. I vented about the, <laughs> the, uh, fuck the city too. Kids that go there. <laughs> well, like the male lady in me used to vent about how dumb college kids are yeah, these days. Yeah, they, they are pretty dumb. Because she'd be delivering mail to the dorms, and they'd be like, "Oh, this isn't for me. This is for current resident." That's you, sweetheart. No, I'm Michelle. No, that means the person currently residing at this address. Oh. And you're like, how the fuck are you alive right now, let alone in college? You see, that, those are the people who grow, grew up on these, like, these privileged yeah. plates and pedestals. Yeah. Like, they weren't gamed up on like real common sense or like, how to communicate yeah. or like, to understand basic things. And so like, when I was applying for a PhD program, yeah, at first, like I was really like, I don't know if I want to do this, but I'm gonna fuck around and see. Yeah. And so, I ended up getting like the most prestigious award anyone can get in science. Wow. It's called the National Science Foundation Fellowship. So basically, I'm considered like one of the, the top uh, early career scientists in this country, which is like hella cool. But like, I don't be asking myself up like that. But <laughs> I'll do it now. That's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> go to the science like, show with your plaque. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> And so, basically, that what that afforded me is um, they that fellowship pays for all my tuition and basically pays for me to stay out of trouble. They will give me like a monthly stipend to just work, focus on my research, and not do dumb shit. I'm like, shit. As soon as I don't have to be drug tested anymore, <laughs> I'm saving this money for something big. <laughs> but, but, um, not um, so when I applied, I already. You know, and this isn't me sounding cocky or arrogant. It's just mm. I already knew how how this was gonna play out mm. because I had that fellowship. I could damn near go wherever I wanted to. Yeah. Because every uh, PhD advisor wants a student with that award because that means that money not coming out of their pocket, mm-hmm. and they reap the benefits of having someone with that distinction. Mm. And so. When I announced it on Twitter, hella professors were in my DMs. I was like, how many of you on Twitter? And so they was just like, hey, you want, we, we want to fly you out. Like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll. I'm like, You're getting hit yeah, on professors just, from I'm other just, schools. I'm on my phone. I'm like, okay, as long as it's United Airlines, I'm stacking my flyer miles because they pay for everything. Yeah, yeah. And so I went all across the country, like going to different places. I knew I wasn't going to go to most of these schools, but I was like, I'm going to travel. Yeah, Fuck it, I'm going to travel. Yeah. That's the hood in you that needs so to take it I knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> exactly. And so, but like back to this Berkeley ain't shit thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's explore that because I'm like, what, what's up with the curriculum? Was it, was, why was it not your first choice? So Berkeley just wasn't my first choice because when I was looking for PhD programs, I wanted to be uh, mentored and guided by someone who understands me inside and out. Mm-hmm. And so... UC Merced was my first choice. Uh, UC yeah. Merced admitted me. They, you know, gave me. They also doubled up on like a really competitive fellowship on top of what I already had. And I was like, "Fuck yeah!" And then the potential PI, him and I are still really cool with each other. Um, he's a person of color. He's he's, uh, he's black. He's, mm-hmm. uh, and he's originally uh, from country out in Africa, as is his wife. 
and I would have essentially been co-advised by them. And they entirely get it, what it means to be a person of color in not just academia and not just science, but our specific field yeah. where we are severely underrepresented hmm. and where going out to do field work could be a life or death situation. And so that's what I was looking forward to. Like I had my mind set, like this is where I'm going. And shit just happened. Um, this little tangential note, but like I got called to do a bone marrow surgery donation wow. oh. to save a complete stranger's life. Yeah. And we can get into that if you want uh, yes. later on. But uh, I signed up for this registry like when I was like 18 because this young lady who I was like dating at the time, uh, she was going to UC Berkeley and wanted to go to the donor drive. And I was like, all right. So I was sitting outside Frau Hall and they're doing the thing and someone came out like, oh, do you want to, you know, do a cheek swab and put yourself on the registry? I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm straight. <laughs> and then they come out, they're like, again, I'm like, you sure? And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. And I was like, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at my watch. And I'm like, I need to go. Like, I got shit to handle out in Richmond. Yeah. Like, you know, cause I was still like in some shit. And so then this fool comes out. He's like, you sure you, we get, you get a free t-shirt. I was like, say no more. <laughs> and so I'm I, sold. I got the t-shirt and I didn't think much of it. And then years later they call me and they're like, Hey, out of over 20 million people, you're the only potential match. And this person only has a couple months to live. And they're like, we no pressure. You don't need to commit to doing this, but if you want to, we need to do this fast. And so in the middle of flying across the country and doing interviews, um, in March of 2018, I had to fly out to Washington, D.C. Uh, because Stanford Medical couldn't accommodate because it's too short notice. Then motherfuckers drilled two holes to my back. I was like, man, this is some shit. Like, even the hood don't treat me like this. <laughs> and so I couldn't walk for two months. Um, oh, man, mm -hmm. it took me nearly two years to recover. And... During that recovery process is when I started looking Filipino because I started gaining the weight. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> um, you know, and it's only until recently, like the last several months, where I've been able to like do physical, strenuous physical activities without having pain in my uh, no my back. back and being able to walk with no pain. Um, so because that happened, I couldn't make I couldn't relocate mm -hmm. to Merced. I already knew that that wasn't going to happen because I wasn't walking. Wow. Yeah, and I'm like, and I'm not gonna be going in like hundred degree heat. Yeah, trying to pull that off. Yeah, no. and so I was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll go to Berkeley, I guess. Um, <laughs> and you know, but you know, it, it all comes down to the weather. The, the, <laughs> yeah. but the, the professor, my 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 PIs, they're really dope. Yeah. I love them. They're cool. It's nothing against them. It's just the institution. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm also very fortunate because now one of my co advisors is the head of the department. Wow. And so like. If I need shit to get done, yeah. shit's going to get done. Yeah. And apparently I fucked around way too much. And now I'm the president of my, <laughs> our student association. Oh. In the oh. like, Damn it. Y'all done fucked up. I done fucked up. Like, we, we, everyone going to get fucked up. Shots is a president. Yeah, shots the president. <laughs> shots the president. And so, like, you know, to me, like, all that shit's wild. That, like, yeah. I'm taking up the space. I'm representing for our folk. And that, you know, this shit's happening. But the wildest shit, and I did not realize this until after I accepted an uh, offer of admission and showed up for orientation, mm -hmm. it was ranked number one program in the world for environmental science and ecology. Wow. I had no fucking idea. I was just applying, all the places I applied to, I was applying to work with specific people. I didn't care about the institution. Yeah. And so when I showed up and they're like, and the dude's like saying, oh yeah, there's the number one program in the world. And I was like, okay, Berkeley over there getting big headed. And so I Googled <laughs> it later. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm one of only a few. And it turned out their admission rate is very, very low. I was oh, like, dang. I was like, damn. And it, like, it surprised me because I'm not a smart person. Um, I consider myself very hardworking and yeah. very curious and creative. I don't consider myself like high Q type person, high, high IQ type person. But um, you're a good leader. I'm a good looking man. And there are different <laughs> forms of, of intelligence expresses yeah. itself in different ways. And it sounds like to me, based on your the things you just described about yourself, you are 
a scientist. And with the hard work ethic, ethic you can be, and sounds like you're about to be, the top scientist or one of the top scientists in your field. I'm going for the Nobel Prize. Fuck that. Ooh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> my, my personal IG says Nobel Prize in preparation. There Nobel you go. Nobel Prize in preparation. <laughs> there you go. But like, no, like when all that happened, I was like, oh shit, like I have arrived. I'm here. Like I'm living my ancestors' wildest dream. Yeah. My, my father didn't graduate high school. Like, mm-hmm. you know, He's a janitor. I grew up cleaning toilets. Like, I started working at age seven cleaning work, toilets That's with where them. the work ethic comes in. And I was like, I remember reaching a point where I was like, man, I don't want to do this. Like, yeah. And he, you know, he's like, well, if you don't want to do it, you better find something else. Like, you do something productive because, you know, I'm not holding your hand type of deal. Yeah. And so, you know, I would say the things worked out really well. But I also acknowledge I'm very lucky mm-hmm. because it's not just hard work that gets us here. Right. I know a lot of people who worked hard. I know a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me, a lot more yeah. creative and curious than me, but they got a bad deck and they're either now deceased or they're incarcerated. And mm-hmm. like, for me, that has always bothered me that most of my friends who I grew up with, they're not around. Like I can't just hang out with them, talk with them. Like you have that survivor's guilt in a way. Somewhat. And like, you know, because maybe, maybe like on two hands I can count how many people I got left in my circle who, yeah. like, I truly grew up with. And mm-hmm. so I would say the silver lining of this pandemic has been, like, I've been able to meet new people yeah. and, like, have a hyper-focused... Meet uh, new pages? Meet new pages. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, did, he, he missed it. You, <laughs> you got to meet my page. <laughs> not, not my back page that's or my fan. That's how we meet people now in the, in the virtual world. Meet, you meet page, my page. Meet my page. <laughs> yeah. Shots from Richmond. Shots from Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I have to cycle back to something you said uh, just a few moments ago. You said that you knew people that you felt were more curious than you, worked harder than you, and maybe even be smarter than you. And I think that sheds light on a particular myth that pervades in a lot of conservative thinking, which says, if you haven't made it here in America, it's, it is... It's just that you're not working hard enough. Yeah. It's that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you'll get there. But it's like, no, there are other things that drag us down. There are systemic things that drag us down. Oh, you want to get deep. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Clear the fucking floor. (laughs) I'm going to lay it out right here, right now, that the idea of success and the idea of uh, professionalism, any of that shit, like, that is all a white supremacist construct that is made to keep us in line to maintain the status quo. Huh. Um, meaning those that operate in power uh, with a racial bent, they are, they are hoping that we condition ourselves to operate on these particular social constructs of what we think it means to succeed or what we think it means to have a rewarding career. Mm. Um, just like the idea of like gender and race, those are all social construct. Like we are, we have been conditioned to think like this is what it is and this is how it needs to be done. This is what you need to be happy. Mm-hmm. And so that idea of if you didn't make it, you didn't work hard enough. That's one of those pervasive uh, issues that has come about it. Yeah. And, and yep. Yeah. No, nope, no, most definitely. And like key point is, I, I mean, I've always said this in regards to uh, holding people to certain constructs that they need to represent. The mm-hmm. question for me is, is, are you what makes you happy? Can you be functional and happy? And if OK, well, if you're fu- by functional, I mean, uh, are you able to put yourself in a position um, without too much hindrance from outside forces uh, to feed yourself, to clothe yourself, to give yourself all the basic needs and then still be defined as whatever you want to define yourself as. And are you still are you still happy? Then I say, great. Yeah. You know, who says you have to walk like a duck, quack yeah. like a duck, but you can't, you know, run like a goat. If you're making your money and you, it makes you happy to run like a damn goat, then run like a damn goat. Exactly. <laughs> and I think some people get to what the standard is mm-hmm. they get to that place and then they're like why am I not happy yeah that's why a lot of motherfuckers are doing therapy and yeah. like what's wrong like yeah. well you were told that this is what was going to make you happy and that's and we realize <laughs> we ate we ate the lie we ate the lie yeah you know that, that's kind of what got me into academics and into photography mm-hmm. it was like I you heard me say earlier like I almost dropped out of high school I wasn't really fucking with it so, mm-hmm. and I, I so I barely graduated high school actually and when I was in college, 
you know, I fucked up several times during my undergrad career. My GPA was not stellar. Yeah. Like it wasn't like I came applying to UC Berkeley with like a 4.0 or anything like that. Wow. But um, but shit, now I got straight A's at Berkeley, so fuck all y'all. <laughs> um, but uh, the that idea that you have to be like academically perfect right um straight a's all the all, yeah, all the time it, like we like i ate that lie and so i suffered the first couple of times i you know first couple of iterations of trying to go to college i dropped out i dropped out like three times i'm not ashamed to admit that like the shit happened look where you are now yeah exactly look That's, where i'm at yeah. i'm in someone's warehouse <laughs> <laughs> with, with strangers <laughs> that you trusted and now to walk through the door yeah. <laughs> but you know that the rope of the chainsaws me, in the back yeah to me like that that's so fucking beautiful yeah um, and what you just said jd fucking beautiful because we we reach a point where we do acknowledge and we have that moment of self-awareness like mm hey, this isn't making me happy. What should I do to make me happy? And I know for me, after I went through a very, very traumatic event of losing my best friend, um, he, he had died by suicide mm. um, over by 41st and Barrett. And Sorry to hear that. He, that just struck a deep chord in me. Uh, that happened like 2010. And exactly a year before he had passed, his mother had died in the same way. Wow. And so... Um, that was like that was a straw that broke the camel's back for me because yeah. I was like shit if I don't do anything different yeah. I'm either going to end up like him or the other friend either incarcerated or you know out here with my wig split in the streets mm -hmm. and so this is the big reason why I don't talk about the shit that I used to do because like it's not that it's triggering or anything like that it's just I've told it to several people before like I don't like people seeing me in that light people see me now they see me smiling they see me like a, as an intellectual yeah and i love that mm -hmm. and i love that people see me as a source of inspiration or a source of uh you know a place where they could talk uh, candidly about anything because that wasn't the case before and so after my friend had passed away <clears throat> i had realized i only had like three pictures with him someone who i'd known for more than half my life and on one hand, while, while I was very upset and very sad about that, I was also kind of happy because I was like, you know what? That means him and I lived a really fun fucking life together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we weren't even concerned about taking pictures. Like you were we in were the just, moment. We were like, we, yeah, we're living in this moment. We're doing everything. We're, you know, whether it's illegal or not, we're like we were doing the shit yeah. and we had fun doing it. We had memories. Like we weren't concerned about oh let, let's capture it yeah but in hindsight i'm just like man like i wish i did because as the years go by some of those visuals in my head do fade like i remember the moment but the visuals those are starting to go away and so i just fucking picked up a camera because i was like i don't want people to have that same feeling right and so i just started documenting everything and it it blows my mind because um this happened several times, but another moment it made full circle. Uh, about three or four days ago, someone hit me up, and he was like, hey, uh, do you have pictures of my friend when you were hanging out with us? Uh, he had passed away, hmm. and we think you were the last one to take photos of him. Wow. And, like, that was deep. Um, he had, you know, his name was Clifford. Clifford, rest in peace, died in a motorcycle accident. And... Um, I had just randomly met him when I was out doing a solo camping trip and the landowner invited some of his friends. So like they were having a party and they invited me up to his property and I'd met them. Clifford was a cool dude and they took pictures of my little money bear over here. <laughs> and so that was the last picture of uh, Clifford. Yeah. Uh, with, oh. It was with the, that group of people and wow. my, my teddy bear. <laughs> and like there's just so much humor and laughter in that. But like that to me is like why I picked up a camera and why I got into photography was to capture those moments so people can have that and cherish that. Yeah. So they they don't experience mentally what I experienced to this day of like having those visuals fade. Right. And but that's also what motivated me to go to college because I was like, fuck this. Like, yeah. If no one's gonna change something, then fuck it, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And I fucked around and like dabbled in some classes and 
I don't know how I got into calculus, but the first test I took, like, I got the highest score in the class. I was like, oh, shit. I knew I was good with numbers in the streets. I didn't know I was good within the class. When, when fucking around goes too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a PhD. Yeah, PhD. That could be a skit. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, like, the math skills, the logic that you need yeah. to have, yeah. Not it's not just about being good with numbers, because depending on what you're doing in the streets, and you have to, you know you gotta stash your money here, take away some money there. It's a lot of coding. There's variables in there. There's A, the unknown, minus X plus 10, and then you're like, oh, all right, that's five. That's we call those eigenvalues. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but like what you, what you just said about the it, logic. You'll start losing me if you guys get into that. <laughs> what is the, what you're just talking about logic though around yeah. mathematics. Like this is what I try to tell a lot of the young people because we, this is another condition thing in our society. Mm-hmm. For all races and all background, this reluctance towards math. The moment you see numbers or uh, any type of uh, parameter or, or anything, operative, yeah. you're like, fuck that. Nah. Give me the money. And so uh, the beauty in understanding the logic and understanding that math is just a lot of logic and thinking. Um, when you understand, like, this is something our ancestors had mastered. Yeah. Like, they they mastered the art of mathematics. Yeah. Like, and the, this was something that many cultures did independently on different continents. But also the beauty of mathematics is that it's its own universal language. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a language that anyone can understand. And for me, like, I always thought, like, when I started coming up myself uh, in academia and, like, really trying to hone in myself and, you know, trying to find out, like, where am I at in this world? Like, when that started sinking in with me, like, shit, math is just an, another language, but it happened to be extremely beautiful because I could communicate with anyone in the world. I could let them know like this is the projectile motion of a rocket or this is the projectile motion of the bullets it's gonna come your way if you fuck with me. <laughs> like you know there's just so much beauty yeah. and and it's in everything yeah yeah that's that's one uh one of my uh high school teachers that really took his time to, to help me understand it. it was my geometry uh, teacher and taught you about ten- the gun and the bullet no <laughs> <laughs> See, this is how you calculate yeah. how long it's going to take for you to duck <laughs> in was, contrast with the speed and velocity of the bullet <laughs> I, I kept explaining to him that for me English was easier uh-huh. yeah I did well in my English classes yeah. I could write about you know whatever and and, and he, he, he explained yeah but with with math there's there's only one answer to this thing and when you deal with like uh, dissecting like poems and that there's multiple answers yep. and people were more complicated than numbers mm-hmm. and I was like oh, that's, that's kind of true and then mm-hmm. the way he broke it down I was able to I actually got like a B in math which for me that's like <laughs> this <laughs> that's yeah that's, I, 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 I live that myself yeah I mean for me my problem was you know like you I was more of an English guy yeah and the issue was really that I kept tackling my math problems as though I was analyzing an essay or trying to construct the theme of something and I would second guess my answers all the time like okay maybe it's actually the the B multiplied by the or may, oh or maybe it's actually the negative thing and it's like my first answer was always the right answer mm-hmm. but I would You'd go back in it. and second guess and then it was like oh shoot I should have gone with negative two yeah. fuck like you know when I mean? they added words, it's like I was overthinking. Yeah, when they add words, when, when, they, when they added words to math, they fucked me up. Like, all right, that's it. I can't do shit. B, like, what the fuck am I gonna do with B? Damn letters. Only have ten fingers still. Fucking like English majors yeah. coming for us again. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, 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 um, I do see that. There's like, there's been like scientists who were illiterate. You know, oh like, hella illiterate, yeah, yeah. dumb and, ass but, illiterate, yeah, but dumb fucking ass illiterate. <laughs> I can go on all day. <laughs> there's some, there's some actors that I'm a fan of, and they're illiterate. I'm like, how the hell do you read your script? Oh, I have someone read it to me, and then explain it to me, and I'll understand it. So it's like, there's when it comes to wrong. academia and like actual like intellect, man, mm-hmm. you can't really go by that. Yeah, you yeah. know, yeah, when you said is... you feel like you're dumb, I feel like I'm fucking dumb, and like <laughs> when you said that, like yeah, me too. <laughs> like I said it in my head, but I didn't want to say it out loud. 
that. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like that, that. If you think you're dumb and you're going for a PhD, what fucking chance do I have? <laughs> we got to ask ourselves what is what is smart, right? Yeah, what is I mean, smart? It's a social I, construct. I, I've always said that's the name of this episode. What is, is smart? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, that's actually really good. We should keep that. <laughs> but you know, I've always said like it's not. I, I had an argument with a friend in high school. I said, you know, your intelligence is not what you know and he was like yes it is said, no it's not like it's not about the amount of knowledge that you have it's about what you can do with it mm-hmm. like a parrot can repeat anything right. back to you yeah. you could tell the parrot one plus one is two and it'll go one plus one is two right but it doesn't fucking understand yeah. what it's saying but if you can understand what you've absorbed yeah. and you can kind of like figure out different ways to to think about what the knowledge that you have and in and create different things from the knowledge that you have and explore and get more that's intelligence yeah because that's i i know that i mean this this seems to be the 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 the, the thing with like growing up like in high school it all comes down to obedience like the most obedient you know, mm-hmm. and when you kind of a rebel, which a lot of us are, I'm a I got, fucking rebel. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was too, and I, you know, I got in trouble for talking a lot. That was my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I would cut class a lot because I couldn't I I couldn't uh, like I would get anxious sitting in class yeah. all all for a whole hour. So like like I can't do it with this class if if I didn't have like some way of being able to express my my stupid jokes yeah. or, or something in there i would get uncomfortable and just cut class and, yeah. and um I, it's just the whole everyone's different everyone learns different i learn better with you know i if i read for too long or i write for too long <laughs> start getting lightheaded <laughs> i'm a i'm a, i need to go out and i see it and i'll, I'll learn that way you yeah. know yeah you're, you're it's, it's, right. like, it's like in that movie harlem nights mm-hmm. with, with eddie murphy and that that um boxer that he, he doesn't even talk at all yeah he's like a champion he, <laughs> like that's another intellect like yeah, like fighting it's kinesthetic learning is yeah, learning with your what, hands yeah. Yeah. right and then visual yeah. learning is learning with yeah. Your, what you see yeah. and then um, then there's auditory which is learning what you yeah. hear mm-hmm. and like what's interesting that you said something about obedience being a key element of education the yeah. trouble with traditional it, it education see, it seems like it to me right. yeah the trouble with addition uh, with traditional education is you have this lecture to group model that doesn't work for everybody mm-hmm. and they're, they've been over the years they've been trying to tweak it like making people acknowledge like hey you're going to have to come up with different projects and things yeah. so that your your different kinds of kids can learn but with the traditional I just speak to you model that kind of requires that all 30 kids shut up and that's hard depending <laughs> on like the age level because with like little ones like once you get up to I think about 12 this changes but from K about sixth grade, they tell you that their attention span per one topic is about maybe two minutes, uh, depending on like what their age is. Yeah. So if you're like six, then it's going to be something like, I think, six minutes long. And it's been a while since I've had this training. If you're eight, it's going to be like eight minutes long or whatever. And then once you hit 12, you, could, you get a little bit more expanded. Mm-hmm. You can go maybe 20 minutes or so. So it's like the challenge of keeping 30 kids with different mindsets, different learning styles hooked on what you have to tell them for that long means that in order to keep them from interrupting you from you having to start your lecture over with or what whatever your lesson is your even your basic instructions is you have to have an axe kind of hanging over their head metaphorically going well if you speak out of turn then you're in trouble yeah because if, if that one kid pipes up the other kids are going to pipe mm-hmm. up then you've lost them that's a lot of pressure to put on like one adult in the room of like 30 ones yeah so you sort of have to do this like blanket like it, it you know and if, you, if you're lucky if you're lucky enough and you have a smaller class size which is one thing i advocate for all the time like we shouldn't have to have 30 kids to yeah. if possible then you, can't you can kind of then you could kind of focus more on like all right well this group over here this of, of six kids over here are better when I give them something to physically do yeah. and this group over here is better if I have and try to just combine all those strategies into one but yeah it's not just about getting you to behave well it's it's, it's about well I mean I just, I'm saying that's what it, that's what it, <laughs> it's, it feels like, it's what, what, like that. what you said earlier it loops into that about the, that idea of like uh, intelligence being associated with what you memorize you know, you know we call that rote memory mm-hmm. um, not 
wrote like writing R O T E if anyone's listening, like what the hell is he talking about? Like <laughs> rote memory. Yeah. Where you just memorizing what you've been told and repeating it. Yeah. And so that's what we often see in traditional educational classroom mm-hmm. that we're just we're trying to program people to just memorize things yeah. and then program them when they're teenagers to just think about entering this capitalistic uh, society as being part of the labor force. Just to produce. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that goes into this other weird conversation about um, how women's bodies are controlled to yeah. just keep producing bodies. Yeah. And this whole I, conversation around abortion rights, like, I can go on for days for that shit as well. But um, the idea around having culturally relevant pedagogy mm-hmm. and educational spaces is important. You mentioned kinesthetic learning, auditory and visual. Something that's really big, uh, particularly in our cultures, is we strive off of kinesthetic and visual learning. Mm-hmm. I know specifically for uh, those of Latinx descent and indigenous descent, visual learning is one of the biggest components of how knowledge is transferred. There is the oral component, but that's a very intimate setting. Mm-hmm. When we're trying to do oral uh, learning or auditory in a much larger space, it becomes difficult because to the point of everyone very different. Yeah. And they're not from the same culture or same mm-hmm. upbringing, uh, same teaching. So having that is very important. And I love that this conversation has morphed into this because yeah, yeah. something that I haven't mentioned, I don't know if you, you found out while meeting my pages, <laughs> um, I'm also an educator. Yeah. Um, I teach uh, fourth and fifth grade students at, for a local nonprofit on wow. Saturdays at Contra Costa College. And it is wild, but it is fun. I love it. Um, my classes, uh, I think this past term was like 30 students, but you, usually I get like 35 students. When we're in person, you can imagine 35 yeah. fourth and fifth graders, the shit is off the hook. Oh, yes. And they have a lot to say. They're telling me things about things going in the house and stuff like that. But a strategy I use is something I learned maybe this is one thing that make Berkeley not shit is um, <laughs> some of the classes that they have that are called active learning classes and the setup. And so I repli- replicated that in my own classroom to have active learning set up and have different pods for different students depending on where they want to be that day. They don't have assigned seating. I'm just like, this is where you want to be today if you want to talk about art, English, math, if you want to uh, work on the semester-long project, they have free will. And in doing that, that allows them to develop more interest in why am I here? Mm -hmm. They will look at me and be like, are we going to learn from you? Mm -hmm. And so as soon as that starts clicking for them, then that's when I've gotten their attention. And then when it's time for me to give them the lesson plan for the day, they don't usually hear too much from me. What I end up doing, and this is the fucking dope part about taking up space where I'm at, I bring in fucking world-class researchers wow. that I know leveraging my social capital so like we got these kids learning about biodiversity population dynamic uh, ecological threat climate change soil health uh, aerodynamics of birds and rockets and like they're doing hands-on activities wildfires we had them measuring trees uh, at the college and understanding like the ecology of tree health fourth and fifth graders making this happen and so, like, I'm very confident that our future's in good hands if the planet still exists. But, um, you know, that's the beauty of... Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gotta find that wood. <laughs> you know, but, you know, that, for me, is like, that's, that's your a big passion. thing. That's yeah, your, and that, yeah. that's what I... For me, that's what it means to be doing this PhD. I'm not doing it for myself. I don't need no fucking credential to right. be curious or to be uh, creative about the world around me or to put my hands in the soil and, like, be like, oh, this is this and this. Like, I don't need a degree for that. My grandfather didn't need a degree for that. And yeah. he, to me, he's the best scientist that I know. He is my favorite scientist. Mm-hmm. He worked for like a drilling company. Yeah. And I've learned much more from him about subsurface technology and soils and geologic features from him than any scientist I've interacted with. And to give perspective, and this isn't tooting my own horn, but I work with the top of the top in these fields. Um, I get letters of recommendation from Nobel Prize winners. Like that, that's where I'm at in life. And so that's beautiful, man. My grandfather's better than them. 
That's whoa, yeah, mic deep. drop. Yeah, <laughs> mic drop. We are at an hour now, and and that's like uh, that kind of like it summarizes what this whole episode's been about. Like you you've been lucky, like you said, you're a hard worker, but you also put yourself in in positions that can help you get to yeah. that next, and you know how to identify we talk about it in the hood we know yeah. how to identify opportunities yeah. <laughs> it's like everything that you've experienced and that you learned has put you and you and it, it's like you're at the right time right place at the right time with the right knowledge yeah. at the time you were you were there at yeah I'm confusing myself <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying like everything's yeah. kind of like it's made sense yeah. like how you and the fact that you are kid from the hood and from Richmond, which we all, and you're, I don't think I've ever met a PhD other than uh, when I work, I do home alarm. Yeah. So like I go to these different. Oh, you, you rob people too. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. My employer's listening. No, I did not. <laughs> but, but, but like, you know, I, I, it just, uh, just, I, I think I mentioned this to uh, some someone else. Like when you see someone with a similar background or from where you're where you're from, mm -hmm. you know we're all tatted up and like yeah. doing something like that. It's 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 uh, it kind of puts it in your mind like I can do something. Yeah. you know the shit's empowering. Like to see someone who looks like you taking yeah. up that space or, you know, for me Berkeley does feel very lonely. Because mm -hmm. I don't see many people like me yeah. are from the area as me, yeah. especially in the graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, there's a bunch of undergrads from our area, but yeah. um, they're in their own bubble. They're in their own world, yeah. and they have to take care of things. When you're in grad school, and this ties into what you said earlier about um, the education system needs to think about like how we contribute knowledge. Yeah. When you're a graduate student, you're contributing new knowledge, and that part of the reason why I decided to go do a PhD I want to contribute new knowledge to this world um, you don't see many people from our communities especially from Richmond in grad school at UC Berkeley and that's isolating yeah. mm -hmm. and it wasn't until recently where like I finally came across someone else who's going to be starting grad school at UC Berkeley another unicorn and I was like, <laughs> yeah another fucking unicorn and I was like amazing and I was yeah. like now it won't feel as lonely Yeah. Like, because that is isolating to not you, I like I have good friends at Berkeley, but yeah. I can't have the same conversation mm -hmm. or decompress in the same way because they can't handle those conversations. It's too intense for them. Mm -hmm. They they don't know how to process that. Like whereas I could casually talk about from someone else from Richmond about like shit that we have to deal with. Yeah. Someone who's never had to deal with that, but like that's just heavy. I need to go see my therapist. I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> I I had a coworker. Um, when I was working for the YMCA after school program and he was a graduate of UC Berkeley he had just graduated like the year before mm -hmm. and uh, he, was, he had one of the warmest hearts I'd ever met in anybody yeah. but he was white Jewish from I think it was Sandy was it San Diego it was somewhere like uh, you know southern southern Cal SoCal and the stuff that my students were going for like going through I mean like, I'll give you an, uh, just an example real quick. He took one kid, um, one, uh, he was an Iranian kid, I think, mm -hmm. and this kid didn't like showing up to class, had poor grades, et cetera, et cetera. But he took that kid, he tutored him after school every day, he made him believe, hey, I can actually do this. This is some stuff that I can get. Yeah. And brought that kid up from F's to A's. And everything was, and then like right when graduation was about to hit, this kid and his brother went out to do some, some shady business with yeah. another kid. They were going to buy a gun, so I'm not saying names. That kid took the gun they were supposed to buy from them and robbed them. Everybody got suspended. That broke my coworker's heart. Like, he went on an alcohol binge. He yeah. couldn't take it anymore. And all the stuff that we had seen up to that year, like, there was a kid that committed suicide. Yeah. There were kids that, you know, he just wasn't, he didn't have it in his background to, for that to be anywhere near normal so yeah. for him this was crushing yeah you know um and it's not it's not an easy world out there you know it, yeah. it's definitely not and, yeah. and um, no, not, that's exactly what tough. i mean when i say like it was great it was beautiful to yeah. finally learn that there's someone else from my community who's for in sure. grad school at berkeley mm. because there is a lot of emotional intelligence that we have to deal with that yeah. other folks don't and so i acknowledge that 
and I'm not gonna put that burden or that heavy stuff on someone on else, yeah. especially when there are everyone at Berkeley, undergrads, grad students, even the professors, faculty, staff, they're all dealing with stress. They're all dealing with the toxicity of that place because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's just another institution that's just churning us inside and out. And so those are things we got to acknowledge. And I know we're, we're kind of coming to a close, but I do yeah. want to make sure I state this unequivocally that um, just because I'm where I'm at does not make me any better than anyone else or whatever accolades I have. And that's a big reason why I don't, typically brag too much about what I do um, academically or research wise uh, you that and that's why I have two separate accounts shots from Richmond that's shots from Richmond that's, yeah. and I have my other account like hood ecologist and even then like I, I'll share I'll share like science shit from here and there but like put a hood twist on it but um, I'm not constantly like oh look at me look what I could do look what I did look at the uh, next that's, award yeah. because I never want people to feel like they have to emulate what I do in order to get there. And mm. I never want anyone to feel like uh, just because they're not where I'm at that they should feel inadequate. No one should ever feel like that. I want people just to see me and see, like, this person just like me. And that's beautiful. And if I, if I want to do something I want, you know, and want to approach him, then he's approachable. Because that's something I learned early when... So I also work for the U.S. government as a federal researcher. <laughs> um, I've been working with them for, over, for almost a decade now yeah. uh, as a researcher with the U.S. Department of Energy. Wow. And so there's several projects. Some of them I can't discuss because I signed NDAs. Yeah. But um, when I first started getting into that, a lot of people were intimidated to reach out to me, even people I grew up with, because they thought, like, oh, shit, he's above us now. Mm-hmm. And so... I would hear from the grapevine, like, oh, they wanted to invite you to speak to their class, but they were scared because, you know, this and that, or, like, they thought, like, maybe you're you're too good for them. I was like, oh, hell no, nah, fuck that. It's so like, almost I'm, like they don't even know you anymore, yeah. right? I was like, shady. I'm taking my Crazy. money, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cash out, I'm going to make other people cash out who yeah. ain't from my community, but my community, I always keep a, a, a good spot for it. And yeah. I'm bringing this in because when you reached out, yeah. I made sure to make it clear, like, I will make time. You just let me know. You ping me this week. I was like, I will make time because that, that's something I do. Like, this pandemic has resulted in me getting a lot more speaking gigs than usual. Mm-hmm. And so my schedule is usually packed. And people cash me out to hear me say some dumb shit. I'm like, <laughs> y'all don't know what you, you're doing. And, and if I would have known a lot of this, I probably would have been intimidated. <laughs> See, and, and, and that's why I don't share it. And that's why like, I try to minimize it. Like, I let people know, I'm a, you know I do science. But I tried my best not to put it on full display because I don't want people to feel intimidated to reach yeah. out. Um, case in point, like just a couple of days ago, one of my mentees reached out to me. He's from out, out in Richmond, too. And he's just like, hey, man, like I'm looking for someone to interview from a project, you know, computer science engineer with at least five years experience. Can you help me? And like one, I, I told him, like, I appreciate you for being brave for asking me. Mm-hmm. I was like, because I would have been intimidated just to ask anyone for help. Yeah. I was like, two, like, thank you very much for thinking that I'm a resource for you. And because, and because I was really proud of that, like proud little mentor moment, yeah. mm-hmm. I went straight for the fucking top and I hooked them up with someone uh, who's like the dopest of the dope, uh, individual named DJ Patel, who is the first U.S. chief data scientist of the United States. Appointed by Barack Obama. Holy shit! And so I hit up my homie DJ. I was like texting. I was like, "Hey, I got this little homie or turtle who like uh, trying to interview." And so like made the connection. Like, yeah. and that again, it speaks to the level of social capital that I have, and I know that I have, but I don't exploit. Mm-hmm. I use that as leverage, like bringing the, bringing people in to talk to my student, mm-hmm. uh, helping my mentee. Um, I'm planning on getting some of the the Nobel Prize leaning uh, researchers and on another project I'm working out here in Richmond um, wow. regarding air quality like I'm I'm trying to get shit done and I don't need the the recognition I'm perfectly fine doing shit in the back channels yeah. and unnoticed I just want to get I just want shit to get done mm-hmm. and I want people to feel happy we talked about this earlier mm-hmm. want people to feel happy with where they're at what they're doing however they're getting their money and how they're living yeah. and if that's what I could close this out with like 
That's a beautiful How message. smart are we? We're as smart as we want to make ourselves. Mm. Amen to that, man. Hey, man. You mentioned, I, I, the last thing I was going to ask you is you mentioned, I, I, first of all, I would like to have you back because there's like a lot of stuff we didn't really. Like, like did we, you guys cover global warming at all? Well, not yet. Not yet. Oh, yeah. That's but one thing we, we got to have. It's a three-part series. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, one, first thing, thank you for coming out, man, and making the time to sit with us, you know. Um, two, we would like to have you back. <laughs> yes. If, once, you know, if you're free another time, like, because there's some, so much more that it would be like an idiot asking a scientist all these questions. That could be the theme of the episode. <laughs> um, hey, we could do that. We've, we, I've done that before with some other <laughs> folks. Like, we did an Ask Me Anything with a group of high school students. Yeah. They fucking went in. I'm oh, like, that would be, that would be great, man. And, uh, Thank you. The last, the other thing. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, you know, you seem to have, like you said, the social capital that you have, mm -hmm. and and that's only gonna better the community in ways that we were talking about yeah. earlier. Um, you did mention where people can find you. Uh, can you repeat that again one more time? Just uh, your, where they can meet your pages. <laughs> oh, you people can find me in Richmond, California, strapped with the camera. <laughs> 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 now, uh, my page is uh, if you're looking for beautiful visual shots from Richmond. Shots from Richmond. If you're looking for a beautiful man, <laughs> hoodie colleges. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you again for your time. Um, I think we're we're like we did an hour and thirty, but it's all great, man. Sweet. Like, that's it, what's up. It, that's what's up. Uh, uh, thank you guys for listening. That's been the voice party. We're, We're out. out. I think you know our next guest. He's actually here. Who's your next guest? Uh,